So for the next 30 minutes, we're going to be talking about ASP.NET and single page applications. Browsers have got really powerful. I mean, the capabilities of browsers today is just incredible. We're getting to the point where it's very close to being on par with native applications and the, and the layout systems that you have there. Um, but the beauty of HTML and, and JavaScript and CSS is it's completely cross-platform. So it works in any browser which implements those web standards. And with HTML and CSS3, we're able to create these sort of magical experiences, these little magical uh, websites that go cross-platform. And the, the objective nowadays, if you're a web developer, is to take that magic, make it responsive, and deliver it on side of desktops, tablets, and mobile. For a server-side web developer like me, though, this can be quite challenging. And it's meant that I've certainly had to learn lots of new skills over the years to become more of a, I don't know, a full stack developer. Um, I've certainly had to learn lots more JavaScript. I've certainly had to learn more HTML, uh, sorry, more CSS. Um, and one thing that I've had to learn a ton of is libraries, JavaScript libraries. For me, um, my JavaScript adventures probably started with, with jQuery. Not this jQuery, this jQuery jQuery, the, 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 uh, the iconic JavaScript library. Um, so popular, in fact, that it's actually, in some instances, replaced JavaScript for many people. People don't even no longer learn JavaScript. They just learn jQuery. Um, and it's really easy to learn. It's got a beautiful, fluent API. There's loads of plugins. It's got powerful DOM selection. It's lightweight, great community su support. You can see why it's popular. But not only has it just been popular over the years, it kind of revolutionized the way that we build websites. Now, jQuery, for me, changed the way that most people or the accessibility of creating fully enabled Ajax websites. So we've had the capability to build Ajax websites since 2001. I think Internet Explorer added the first XML document uh, type so that we were able to pass XML documents over the wire. Uh, I think Outlook Web Access was the very first Ajax enabled website. But it wasn't until jQuery came along and became really, really popular, and web developers discovered that it was very easy to process JSON or XML files and start creating dynamic websites that we started to change the way that the web works. Traditionally, as an ASP.NET developer, somewhere in the mid-2000, the mid-noughties, I would build uh, an application like this. I'd have a client browser, which was attaching to my web server where my ASP.NET application was sitting, and I'd make a request to a URL, say, site.com forward slash products, and the server would respond with the HTML, CSS, images, and JavaScript. And then subsequently, if I made a request to a different URL, perhaps product number six, I would get the full payload again, the HTML, the CSS, the images, and JavaScript, even though there were the only difference perhaps in that whole kind of request pipeline was the product number being changed. So product number six data was really the only thing between these two pages which changed. Well, jQuery made it very easy to start thinking about OK, if I make a request for a product, the first time, of course, I get the HTML, CSS, images, and JavaScript. But then if I just want to change the product on that page, then all I really need to pass down to the user is that piece of JSON product data, which could then be bound to the, the, the application, bound to the view. And then I have the sort of basics of a single page application. Rather than doing full page reloads, I'm starting to uh, so modify small portions of the screen at a time and small modifications of the, of the view. Now, the thing is, though, if we're using something like jQuery, the problem would be that it becomes very difficult very quickly to manage the complexity in our application because all of a sudden we've got lots of different areas of our app which are changing consistently. And so we start needing to require libraries and frameworks to manage this sort of problem. And there are lots of, manage there's lots of these libraries out there. One of the first ones I ever used was a thing called knockout.js, wonderful library written by a guy called Steve Sanderson. If you're in the ASP.NET community, you may know Steve. Um, he wrote the Rocks book on ASP.NET MVC3. Um, he obviously wrote knockout.js, which is a very popular JavaScript uh, library for, for kind of managing single page applications. Um, he wrote the Ibiza portal for Azure, or he was part of the team which wrote the Ibiza portal for Azure, which is the world's largest knockout application. So if you're using Azure, uh, portal.azure.com, that is the, uh, the Ibiza portal, I guess. Um, uh, and now, quite recently, he joined the ASP.NET team, and he's looking at single-page applications inside of ASP.NET. So we're in good hands. But what knockout.js gave to us was this idea that we could take 
or we could template um, our, our application, and we could um, we could implement a pattern, um, uh, an architectural pattern to our to our, to our, our site. And in this instance, it's an MVVM, model view view model. So it's kind of lending a little bit from the rich internet application era, the RIA application from Silverlight, when they had this concept of MVVM. And he's brought that Silverlight concept fundamentally through to HTML and JavaScript. Um, <coughs> very powerful kind of ability to have a, a JavaScript model or a state, the current state of the application, and then have the, the UI automatically refresh based upon the state of the application. So no longer was I saying document.getElementById and making changes to my, um, my page, or even using the, the, the shizzle selector in jQuery, selecting an element and changing the inner HTML or the values uh, of different things. I was binding, declaratively binding my view to my JavaScript model, and then any updates that happen in my JavaScript model were automatically refreshed with my page. Now, knockout.js is an excellent library. It's still very much under active development. Um, we use it extensively here at Microsoft. Um, but obviously, people want different things from their frameworks. And one of the common complaints about something like Knockout is it's, it's quite verbose in terms of the amount of, of, of templating code that you have to write, the amount of backing JavaScript that you have to write. So other frameworks came around. And when we started with MS Web Days, and uh, me and Martin Kern hit the road uh, maybe two years ago now, our site was written in this thing called Ember.js. Ember.js, sorry. Um, Ember.js is a lovely little framework, very succinct. It has all the benefits kind of, of, of what Knockout does, but you have to write less code because they've, um, they've, they've, they have a, a sort of more convention-based system. Um, it's a very nice system. One of the problems with this framework, or it wasn't when we were using it at least, was that you no longer have HTML. You just have HTML inside of these script tags, and they're injected automatically at runtime by, by the framework, which is, is, is great, and it, it works. And certainly, we, we used it to some extent on our website. But <coughs> after a while, people were saying to us, why are you using Ember.js? Have you not heard? There's a new kid in town, and that kid is Angular.js. And that's the thing with JavaScript frameworks. There's, there's always a new one. And so whenever we were doing our MS Web Days um, with Ember.js, people would always say, you should try Angular. Um, it's weird now that we moved to Angular for our, some of our site, that people now always seem to say that we should be moving to React or we should be moving to whatever. <coughs> um, the reality is all of these three frameworks, Knockout.js, Ember, Angular, they all have different pros and cons. Some of it is uh, writer, the ease of writing. Some of it, the ease of development. Um, but you shouldn't really get, I always think, you shouldn't really get hung up on this thing. If you've got an application which works, it works. And you could build a, a working application in any three of those languages. And really, the choice of what language you choose comes down to, to you know, your, your personal preference of syntax and stuff, but also your, your team and what they're familiar with and maybe what they've got experience with. Fundamentally, though, I would recommend, strongly recommend Angular. It's a very well-written um, single page application framework. Um, it's actually, there's two versions of Angular, if you will. There's the, the thing which is in production, and if you're building sites today, you could probably use which is Angular 1, um, or just regularly known as Angular. Um, that's what most people will be using in production today. It's the fully baked, fully finished kind of framework. Um, it's battle hardened, it's been used uh, extensively, um, and it's uh, it's got a uh, a much a very clean syntax that you, you use to write it. One of the things that we liked immediately when you started using Angular was the fact that we're still back in HTML. It's not um, in closing everything inside of script tags. It's real HTML, but we're um, making uh, mar we're marking some of the HTML elements with these different um, directives, or we're adding different directives to the to the page. So directives are they're a little bit like the tag helpers that we saw in ASP.NET, but they're obviously executed at runtime in JavaScript. And we instrument our views and so forth with these directives. And we can create, um, with uh, an MVC pattern, we can create a really nice little uh, single page JavaScript application. <coughs> One of the things that we really liked about it was that this, there was this strict separation. And it was very opinionated as a framework, which I like. Um, the documentation was good, and it showed you exactly what you should be doing to build this Angular application. Now, if you are confused by all of the 
plethora of JavaScript frameworks that are available for you to do single page applications. There is a great website called To Do MVC. And what the guys at To Do MVC do is they take um, modern JavaScript frameworks and they try and build the same application in all of them. So here we have um, uh, the, the front page of the website and they do stuff like, you can see there, Backbone.js, AngularJS, Ember.js, Knockout.js, Dojo, Knockback, Can Use, Polymer, React, Mevthrill, Ampersand, Flight, Vue, all sorts of different JavaScript frameworks. Not only do they do raw, plain old JavaScript frameworks, they also do compile to JavaScript frameworks. Now compile to JavaScript frameworks are frameworks that you write in a different language, but they ultimately get compiled down to JavaScript. So um, Angular 2 is a compile to JavaScript framework, whereas Angular 1 is a plain JavaScript framework. So if you're writing Angular today, the I guess the in, in Angular 1, generally you'll be writing it in pure JavaScript. You could use TypeScript, you could use um, other systems and so forth, but the, the, the kind of the base stuff it happens in the way you expect it to write it to be in regular JavaScript. In Angular 2, it's expected that you would use something like TypeScript. Um, TypeScript's the default uh, in Angular 2. If you go to the documentation, Google recommend TypeScript. Um, <coughs> but you can also, I believe, build it in Dart and probably in CoffeeScript as well. But the idea that you're writing in a different language, which then ultimately compiles down to JavaScript. But to do MVC guys, they take the same application, a very simple to do application, they implement in all these different frameworks, and then they give you the code, so you can see all of the code, and um, with comments about what they liked and what they didn't like about the different frameworks, and how they implement stuff. And it's a great little resource to look through and see, okay, I like what they do in, say, Backbone here, I like what they do in Angular here, I like what they do in Ember here, and it makes it easy to choose which framework suits you, because ultimately these frameworks do very similar things. And the reality is, you want to choose one which fits you and your team well, rather than worrying too much about what's the newest and coolest and latest and greatest one. So we used Angular in our application, Angular 1, in the application, which... Uh <coughs> um, so the basic things that we start having to do when we start building into an ASP.NET Core application, well, first we need um, a view. Um, so I have my, uh, my view here, this is my base page, and you'll see one of the very first things that I have in this is a, and that's the, the, the top div, which is colored in yellow. Um, we've got a div, which is my ng hyphen app. So this is where the app is going to appear. And inside that uh, div, I've got another div saying ng view. And this is where my views are going to appear in my application. On the view, I've got some uh, tag helper <coughs> inside of my script, which, um, depending on the environment that I'm currently in, will load in different JavaScript libraries. If I'm in staging or production, I'm going to use the CDN, the Content Delivery Network versions of uh, Angular. If I'm in development, I'm going to use local versions of my, uh, of my application, uh, sorry, of the JavaScript libraries. So I'm going to use um, whatever's in lib, Angular, <coughs> JS if I'm in development. I'm going to use the CDN ones from Google's CDN if I'm in production. <coughs> I'm then including a number of other JavaScript uh, uh, libraries for the application. We're using Angular Roots. Rooting's not part of Angular uh, Core anymore. Uh, it's actually a separate um, sort of add-in to Angular, if you will. You don't have to use Rooting, so they've sort of removed it from the, the base core. So you opt in by using Angular Root, that JavaScript library, and then we can use it throughout our application. I'm also using Angular Bootstrap, which is a, a way of using um, Bootstrap inside of an Angular application. I'm using a little thing called High Charts, which allows me to draw charts, which I use um, on the application uh, when we look at the feedback for the day. We use some charts to just show the feedback of, of different views for different uh, talks. And then I've got the uh, app.js, <coughs> which is where actually my business logic for my application sits. So if you've not seen uh, if you've not seen the application, I'm just going to show you. So if we go over to where's my thing there? I go mswebj.net feedback. 
this is the feedback system. And you'll see there was a screen which you didn't see just there. I'm just going to log out. Um, but this is all our Angular application. I'm going to sign in with that as my handle. I've got various different sessions that I can rate. I'll rate the various sessions. Say great. Oops, that's what it smells like. Submit that rating. And um, various, uh, and then it will show me, I don't know why it's connect, not connected to the right API, yeah, but never mind. Um, it will show me the various people which have fed back throughout the day um, using the high charts chart which we have. So what that means is that uh, that that little application, this is the base page for that application. And so um, I've got the high charts little thing which is included there, which I used. I've got the, uh, the Angular bootstrap stuff that we use for the layout and so forth. So that's my base page. All of the JavaScript libraries are loaded in. To get some of those uh, things, I use Bower. So we looked at Bower earlier today. Um, so I added all my dependencies into my Bower.json file inside of ASP.NET. So my, my dependencies are Angular, Angular Root, Angular Bootstrap, High Charts Release, and High Chart NG, which is the directive for High Chart. Um, those are all of the JavaScript files that are, you've seen included there. And then I create my application. So we saw just down, oh, excuse me, just down here, you see I included the feedback app, app.js. We have um, in that app.js, I just create an anonymous function and uh, I create a, an angular.model called rating app. We save that into a variable called rating app. We can define the requirements of uh, my Angular application. So here I'm saying my Angular model relies on ng root, it relies on UI bootstrap, and it relies on high charts ng. One of the cool things about Angular is if, for example, one of those scripts didn't load for whatever reason and highcharts.ng is not available, um, this application will throw an error, which uh, is useful because in Java, that's one of the problems when you're building really complicated JavaScript applications. You have lots of dependencies, but um, there's no real way to declare them. And the great thing about um, these Angular modules is that if something's not available or aware, it's going to throw errors that you can handle. Um, and you can just display errors to users, or perhaps you can reload your application or, or whatnot, but at least you know about it, at least you can handle those errors. So this is a great way of, of, of defining, well, this particular model has these particular dependencies, and um, you're declaring that up front. <coughs> um, in the current version of Angular, we have this concept of routing. It's an MVC client-side library. This actually makes it quite difficult or complex sometimes to think about when we're looking at uh, ASP.NET when we're using Angular, because we now have two versions of MVC. We've got MVC on the client side and MVC on the server side. So we have to set up our routes on the uh, on the Angular side, on the client side, and we have to set up our routing on the server side as well. <coughs> so what we're saying here is I set rating app.config, and uh <coughs> this is basically the 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 function which I need to set up my routing. And I say to the route provider, when the URL for my application is slash feedback, I want to go to a particular point in my application. I want to go to the signing controller. And the signing controller is the bit which is going to handle someone entering their username and then pressing sign in, the button on the screen. And when they press the sign in bit, I want it to go to that sign in controller. And if they're actually already signed in or they've signed in previously, I want you then to forward them somewhere else. Um, actually forward you to the, the feedback dash ratings bit. And um, we handle all of that logic inside of the controller. So when someone goes to the URL slash feedback, mswebday.net slash feedback, they, we open up the template URL you see there, and we enter, the, we go to the, the controller, sign in controller, and that handles all of the logic for the application. If they go to feedback slash rating, there's a template URL for our uh, for our application there, which will, um, <coughs> it will take that HTML, that partial HTML, and it will put it into the view, which is inside of my Angular application. 
and it will go to the ratings controller. And if the URL is feedback slash results, then we will go to um, that particular template URL, feedback dash partial slash results, and we'll go to the results controller. Otherwise, if the URL is anything else, it's going to redirect back to feedback. The other thing I'm setting on the location provider is HTML5 mode. In, in Angular, HTML5 means mode means that it will use um, it will use uh, pretty URLs basically. Um, prior to some uh, HTML5, the H HTML5 history feature in browsers, um, you would have only been able to um, control the URL using what we call a hash bang, which is like if you ever see a URL with a hash in it, that's a hash bang. Um, but with HTML5, we're now able to use proper full URLs and resolve those in, in JavaScript. So by switching that on, it means that the Angular will not use hash bangs, it will just use full URLs. Then on the server side, I've set up a, an MVC route. And what I'm trying to do here is, is two things, really. I want anything which goes to feedback, partials, these are going to be the templates that I used in my Angular application. Um, so I need to route my, my little pieces of um, my little templates, which I'm going to be using in my Angular ac action. The other thing, the other route that I've set up is anything which is at the URL feedback slash anything, I want it to point to the same HTML or the same view. Because this is a single page application, I don't want it to go to a different page every time. I want it to end up at the exact same base page every single time. So. Um, this route, all it says is that anything which has got feedback on it, slash anything, it's going to go back to the feedback controller and to the action index. And then I'll handle routing through to the actual right, the correct file. So if we look at one of those partial HTML pieces which get loaded in when you, uh, when you go to the feedback URL, this is the template piece of HTML which gets loaded, and it goes to the... Um, the sign-in controller. So the HTML is pretty straightforward. Um, we've got some divs, which says H1, which says hello. And it says a P tag, which says please enter your email. I've then got an input tag, which has a, an ID of contact ID. And it says ng-model contact ID. What I'm saying there is this input control is bound to the model, my JavaScript model, to the property contact ID. Excuse me, contact ID. And then I've got a button, and I'm binding that button to the controller um, to the sign in method inside of that uh, controller. So I've got two elements really on that uh, sign in page. One, I've got the input box where a user is going to enter their contact ID. And I've got a button which, when they press it, it's going to execute this sign in function. So if I go to the controller, you'll see the first thing I do is I can say rating app dot controller. I create this controller called a sign in controller. I put the function which shows all of the different things that I'm going to be depending on throughout the application. And one of the things I depend on is this thing called a cred store. The cred store is a little object which is unique to my application, which is where I'm going to store the, the, the whatever the username is that person, the contact ID that, that, that person has entered into the application. I'll say if the cred store is valid, um, and valid, by the way, means um, you know, have they entered a contact with they previously, then I'm going to forward them on to, um, uh, it shouldn't say lab angular there, it should say the uh, feedback uh, slash rating. I'm going to send them back to that particular feedback element of the application. And if they are pressing the, uh, the sign in button, I'm going to make a HTTP post over to our API that we created earlier, and I'm going to post in the contact ID. Now, you'll see this, this dollar scope. This is really common in Angular. Um, what it means is that is the, the, um, the kind of model which gets passed through in the particular for this particular controller. So you see that it says scope.signin. That's a function inside of this application. And if you look to the last page, you had a button said ng-click equals sign in. So that bind, binds that button to 
that particular scope. So when that button is pressed, it's going to execute scope.sign in. It's going to go to HTTP post, post up to the URL, and it's going to pass in scope.contact ID. Now, I've not declared contact ID anywhere, but obviously, because um, in the HTML template, I said that the input box had an ng, the input box had an uh, ng model contact ID, it's going to automatically bind um, dollar scope contact ID to that text box. So whatever they entered into that text box is going to get passed to that URL as an email property, or as a promise, pr a parameter uh, uh, email. And when that thing responds, when the API responds, I'm going to get a response. And whatever the response is, I'm going to save that into my cred credential store, and then I'm going to forward them on to the ratings portion of my application. So Angular has this concept of um, uh, dependency injection. So dependency injection um, means that when I, in my application, when I set up the, uh, the sign-in controller, I said that this controller was going to use a thing called CredStore. Now, Angular is not going to know what CredStore is. It doesn't know how to create one. It's not part of Angular. It's something that's unique to my application. But I have, in here, I have um, said to, oh, excuse me, I've gone to the wrong page. I have said the rating app dot factory, and then passed in this cred, cred store as the first property. And this is declaring to Angular to say, if you ever come across a thing called cred store anywhere in the application or any controllers, this is how you create one of these things. And it's quite useful because um, Angular will only ever create one of these things. It's got the uh, the ability just to it will only ever it will only ever create it once inside of the application lifecycle. So once it's been created once, you can guarantee that you'll get the same object back every single time. And so it's quite useful for, for this uh, instance where what I wanted was to implement something which would just store the current user who's logged in's information. So I created this little object called CredStore, and it's got a number of functions on this little object. One's set, one's logout, one's valid, one's get. And it just returns it as an object. So I can call uh, credstore.valid, and it re will re ultimately return. Is local storage for this application, is its contact ID in local storage greater than zero? So it is something stored in contact ID. Um, I can call logout, which will just basically set the log, the local storage contact ID to null. Um, I can set the local storage contact ID to a, a particular contact ID. Or I can get the current local storage uh, information as well. So in any controller, when I pass in the idea of a cred store, uh, or, or say that I'm going to be using cred store, Angular is clever enough to look through its factory and say, oh, I know how to create one of them. Martin's declared it in this rating app dot factory. And so it will create one of these new objects for me. And then I can then call into that as well. So that's dependency uh, injection inside of Angular. So we've kind of gone through a, a, a few things there. We've got um, we've got uh, um, directives. There's uh, there's kind of there's controllers. There's um, dependency injection, which happens. Um, there's scope. These are all particular things that are, are kind of poignant if you're building Angular one applications. Angular two isn't just like a, a, a a syntactical change. It's a very conceptual, conceptually different sort of uh, thing. Um, and obviously, we're not going to have time to go into uh, into Angular two in, in any detail in this very short thing. But what I would say is that if you want to, if you're interested in, in Angular or Angular two, we do have on uh, on Microsoft Virtual Academy, we have um, some courses where you can go and have a look at how you would build these things, and they're far more in depth than obviously you can do in thirty minutes. Um, full courses on Angular and explaining how you would use it uh, in real production sites and what the difference between this and then Angular 2 is, you can you can go through and see the Angular 2 courses as well. Um, but that's it, really. All I wanted to say was single applications are important. And even if you're a server-side ASP.NET developer, you're probably going to have to start thinking about using Angular if you're not already using it today or a single-page framework. They're nothing to be scared of, really, and they're quite easy to use. Um, and there is a lot of choice out there, and ultimately, it doesn't really matter. Most of these things do very similar things. It's just different syntax, different concepts, and so forth. So 
Um, if you're stuck which one to choose, then there's some, some great resources out there with um, the uh, to do MVC application, which can show you all the different opportunities, all the different frameworks and how you could implement them. Um, but what I would say is uh, pick a framework, and if you don't know which one to pick, just pick Angular, because it's possibly the greatest. Um, and then uh, learn that on, on something like uh, Microsoft Virtual Academy, where we'll give you full instructions on how to learn this stuff. And it will definitely improve your web applications if you do learn a single page application framework. So thank you very much.